Much of the conversation around climate change centers on things like lowering carbon emissions, which is obviously critical. But we think the public health response to climate change should be a larger part of the conversation. Whatever we do moving forward to address climate change, there's no avoiding the fact that we still face consequences. That sucks, but we can soften the blow if we prepare ourselves. And that's the topic of this week's healthcare triage. Mitigation and adaptation are major components of public health preparedness, and both are relevant to a health-focused approach to climate change. Mitigation mainly encompasses efforts to slow or reverse climate change, which will depend largely on policies made outside of the public health sector, but which will have obvious benefits for our health. Adaptation, however, is where public health efforts should really shine. In 1994, a committee of health-minded professionals got together and developed the 10 Essential Services of Public Health. Borrowing examples from a paper published in the American Journal of Public Health, we're going to cover the role of each of these public health services in addressing the many health-related problems that accompany climate change. The first essential service is to assess and monitor population health. In the realm of climate change, this means tracking changes in health and disease trends on a warming planet. The second service is to investigate, diagnose, and address health hazards and root causes. This means investigating disease outbreaks that result from climate change. This includes waterborne diseases, foodborne diseases, and diseases spread by vectors like mosquitoes and ticks, all of which are increasing as the planet warms. The third service is to communicate effectively to inform and educate. This requires public health officials to learn and practice effective communication techniques to keep the public aware of and informed about the health effects of climate change, and maybe focus on getting this information to the public via routes like, I don't know, YouTube channels. The fourth service is to strengthen, support, and mobilize communities and partnerships. This one's about collaboration, nurturing relationships with both industry and community, and providing needed support for their efforts to create and implement climate solutions. The fifth service is to create, champion, and implement policies, plans, and laws. A climate-related example of this one will be the creation of plans such as a municipal heat wave preparedness plan that is ready to go in the case of a severe heat wave. The sixth service is to utilize legal and regulatory actions. This one gets a little tricky because it's a balance between creating healthy conditions and respecting people's autonomy and interests. We became pretty familiar with this tricky relationship during the COVID-19 pandemic, and the same tensions start to arise in matters of climate change. Legal measures taken to protect health on a warming planet may not always be warmly received, and it'll take work to find the right balance. The seventh service is to enable equitable access. This step requires that health services be provided in an effort to prevent or address the health effects of climate-related disasters. Careful consideration will be necessary to ensure that these services are provided equitably, not just to rich nations and rich neighborhoods who will already suffer less from climate change, but to nations, neighborhoods, and people who traditionally have lower access to health care and far fewer protections against disaster. The eighth service is to build a diverse and skilled workforce. This mainly refers to the training of healthcare providers that are educated about the relationship between health and climate change and have the skills to educate their patients about that relationship and to identify and address the health issues that individual patients face as the planet warms. The ninth service is to improve and innovate through evaluation, research, and quality improvement. This one might be our favorite, mainly because it calls for more research. We absolutely need more research to understand the health effects of climate change and the best ways to address them. And finally, the tenth service is to build and maintain a strong organizational infrastructure for public health. A strong public health infrastructure is critical to our ability to respond appropriately to any public health crisis, climate change included. Based on our pandemic response, we've definitely got some work to do here. These 10 services provide a foundational look at the important role of public health in the climate crisis, but each service will need to be multidimensional to address the various needs of many different populations. Public health professionals and medical service providers must be ready to adapt policies, information, treatments, and other services based on who they are addressing and where. For example, some countries, and even different regions within countries, will be facing different threats based on factors related to their specific location and resources. Some areas of the world will be facing issues related to extreme storms and flooding, while others will be grappling with extreme drought. Other areas will have many resources, 
while people from other areas will sorely lack the resources necessary to cope. To ensure health equity across these populations, particularly those lacking resources, these kinds of differences absolutely have to be accounted for. This will require that we look at local data to determine area-specific issues and that we partner with local people and organizations to fully understand their needs. Building Resilience Against Climate Effects, or BRACE, is a program from the CDC that assists in the development of public health strategies for communities to prepare for the effects of climate change. The program has five basic steps. Anticipate climate impacts and assess vulnerabilities, project the disease burden, assess public health interventions, develop and implement a climate and health adaptation plan, and evaluate impact and improve quality of activities. Some of the program's recommendations include incentives like tax breaks and grants for positive climate actions, and awards for work and or innovative solutions to address climate problems. In areas where extreme heat is or will be an issue, the program recommends tree planting programs that'll help cool cities, retrofitting public buildings with improved cooling technologies, and updating building codes to include heat mitigation strategies. In areas where water quality is compromised, the program recommends partnering with water utilities and resource managers to fully understand an area's vulnerabilities and base intervention and adaptation strategies on those specific needs. Likewise, in areas facing air quality issues, the program recommends partnering with local air quality managers to assess the risks and form appropriate strategies. Our understanding of the potential health effects of climate change are still evolving. But that's no excuse for health officials to be hands-off. Reacting to public health threats as they evolve, think global pandemic, is part of the job description. And one thing we know for sure is that a warming planet is a major public health threat. Hey, did you enjoy this video? You might enjoy this previous video on the inequities of climate change. We'd appreciate it if you'd like the video and subscribe to the channel. Maybe even go to patreon.com slash healthcare triage where you can help support the show and make it bigger and better. We'd like to especially thank our research associates, Joe Sevitz and Edward Lillaholm, and of course, our surgeon admiral, Sam.